Hello and welcome. I'm Roger Ream, and this is the Liberty and Leadership Podcast, a conversation with TFAS alumni, supporters, faculty, and friends who are making a real impact in public policy, business, philanthropy, law, and journalism. Today I'm joined by David Ray, one of a number of TFAS graduates who have or currently serve in state legislatures across the United States. David is in his second term as representative for Arkansas's 61st House District. He's passionate in fighting to eliminate the state income tax and to make his state a safer place. In my conversation today, we'll hear about David's political career and his time with TFAS, including how he met his wife, Jessica, during his summer here in DC. David, thanks for joining me. I very much look forward to speaking with you today. Hey, thanks for having me, Roger. It's good to be with you. Now, David, there must have been something in the water the year you attended TFAS in 2007, uh, as a number of your classmates have also run and now serve in elective positions, including in North Carolina, Kansas, and Oklahoma. Uh, was your TFAS experience that summer a factor in inspiring you to run for public office in Arkansas? Well, uh, I think it, it certainly played a role in leading me down the path that, that I went down. Um, I really enjoyed my summer in, in TFAS. I did the, the economic and, and comparative political systems program. And, you know, academically, it was challenging. It was good. Uh, it was something I needed. Um, you know, the caliber of students that TFAS selects, as you know, is is very high. I mean, there's there's no bad students in any of those classes. And so the discussions that you have, the the debates that you have with your classmates, the the issues that you talk through really help shape and, and refine your positions and challenge your thinking on things. And um, so academically, it was it was a great experience. But, you know, professionally, it was probably even more influential because it gave me the opportunity to to do an internship with the National Republican Senatorial Committee and really kind of got me started, helped me help. I tell people that um, working there helped me, uh, the campaign bug bit me pretty hard and I had thought about and wanted to go to law school straight out of undergrad. But, um, you know, after, after working on campaigns and, and in electoral politics, I decided that I wanted to give that a try, and that really led me down a very different path than I intended to go. Um, and but but also um, just socially, TFAS was a great opportunity for somebody from who was from a really small town in West Tennessee to be able to spend a summer in our nation's capital and see and do things um, that I would have otherwise never been able to do was was a really um, formative experience for me. Before we talk a little more about your career and your work in the state legislature, I have to ask you about the fact that you met the woman who became your wife in our program. I'm told by my staff that we've had nearly or just over 90 TFAS marriages as a result of our program, uh, which is about two per summer uh, since we've been doing them. But tell me about that experience in meeting uh, a classmate, uh, Jessica Egan. Yeah, well, th th I didn't know the number was 90. That's quite a bit. Yeah. Um, that really lends a lot of credence to uh, this joke that my wife and I have always had, which is that uh, TFAS is the world's most expensive dating service. Um, right. But uh, she, my wife, Jessica, she was, she, she was originally from Ohio, and she was attending Mount Union College, and she was in the journalism program. Um, after finishing school, she went on to, um, be a reporter in Ohio for several years before we got married, but we met, I think that first weekend at TFAS, there was, a maybe you call it a social or a function. Um, there was a party there in the, in the courtyard at the apartments, uh, at the time we were on Georgetown's campus. Georgetown, yeah. And, um, yeah, we, we hit it off and, uh, became fast friends and, I think went to a nationals game the next day and consider that our first date and fast forward to 2023. We've been married for 10 years now and we have a five-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son and uh, life in Arkansas is great. So, well, good. That, that means in uh, 
Well, about 13 or 14 years, we'll expect to see your daughter at the uh, welcome her to Washington to attend one of our programs. Absolutely. Go full circle that way. We've had a remarkable number of uh, children of alums attend our programs and uh, that's just great. Uh, wonderful experience. No grandchildren yet, but that may be coming in a few years because we've been around for 55. Uh, so after, after TFAS, uh, what led you to Arkansas? Well, so I went to college in Arkansas. Uh, I went to University of the Ozarks oh, right. yeah. and studied communications and political science there. And after, uh, after I graduated, um, really the, the NRSC where I had interned hired me to work for them for the 2008 election cycle. And instead of being in DC, they needed me uh, in the States. So they sent me to spend time in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Georgia, um, and worked on those three Senate races, primarily doing uh, opposition research and field research for the committee. Um, and that was um, just a really great way to learn how campaigns work. And that sort of launched me on a, a trajectory where, like I said, the campaign bug bit me pretty hard. I moved to Virginia in 2009 and worked for Ken Cuccinelli on his attorney general's race. And after that, managed several campaigns. I moved to Western Kansas and managed a congressional primary out there and um, helped elect a former member of Congress there, Tim Hillscamp. Uh, managed an AG race in Kentucky in 2011. And managed another race for Congress in upstate New York in 2012. And um, it was Jessica and I had been dating long distance um, through those years. And we decided to get married there in 2012. And she sort of not so subtly indicated that we didn't need to move every 12 months to work on a different campaign. And Arkansas was where I had some roots. I uh, haven't gone to school there. A lot of friends there that, that from college Republicans that worked in politics. And so it seemed like a natural fit for, for us to put down some roots and go back to work there. I worked for the state GOP there for a little while and was Tom Cotton's communications director on the 2014 U.S. Senate campaign. Um, and then I ran our state's Americans for Prosperity chapter for a few years, uh, served as chief of staff to our lieutenant governor at the time, Tim Griffin, who's now our, our attorney general. And um, really after serving uh, in and around the legislature with Americans for Prosperity and in the attorney or sorry, in the, in the lieutenant governor's office, um, sort of became disillusioned in a lot of ways with how our Republican supermajorities were governing in Arkansas. And um, when you observe the process up close, you sort of think to yourself, you know, how would I be able to impact this process? How can I make a difference? And I felt like I had something to contribute. So threw my hat in the ring and, and won my race. And now I'm in my second term. It takes courage to uh, put your hat in the ring and run for office. And so I admire that. Uh, and I, I know that one issue that you were passionate about when you ran was uh, that the tax issue and trying to do something, you know, I know uh, your neighboring home state of Tennessee does not have a state income, personal income tax. Uh, Arkansas, I guess, does. Uh, and are you hoping to repeal the income tax in Arkansas? Yeah, that is the long-term goal. I'll, I'll back up and say that th this issue that you have brought up of taxes really was the catalyst that sort of pushed me to run, uh, to make that leap from being, you know, working for candidates that I um, admire and want to help, help boost uh, into, you know, trying to, to seek elective office for myself. In our 2019 session, we had six different tax increases that were passed in Arkansas. And that just shocked me, you know, in a deep red state with uh, nearly 80% uh, Republican control of both the House and the Senate, a Republican governor, how could we pass six different tax increases? So that really motivated me to run. Um, and it was a big issue in my race. Um, you know, I was very much opposed to um, there was a big gas tax increase that was on the ballot and I, I was opposed to that. So, um, but yes, the, the income tax is something that I've been focused on for a long time, right? Because, you know, one of the most basic laws of economics is that you, you get more of what you incentivize and less of what you penalize. And the income tax penalizes all the wrong things. It penalizes work and labor and productivity all things that, that we want more of 
um, not less of as a society, as policymakers. And you look to our to our west and to our east, you know, Texas yeah, has Texas, no income yeah. tax. Tennessee has no income tax. You look at the states around the country where population is resorting itself to Florida, to uh, Arizona, to North Carolina, Indiana. These are all places that either have very low income tax or no income tax at all. Um, and so I want Arkansas to move in that direction to join that list. And, you know, when I first started talking about this several years ago, um, I don't think there was anyone in our state government um, besides my boss at the time, uh, Lieutenant Governor Tim Griffin, who really took this idea seriously and said, yeah, we can do it. Everybody sort of poo-pooed this idea, said it's pie in the sky, it's never going to happen. And people just make excuses all the time, right, for why we can't do stuff. You know, they say, oh, well, Nevada has all this tourism and Florida has beautiful beaches and, you know, but, you know, there's other states that don't that, that don't have those advantages. You know, Tennessee doesn't have um, Las Vegas. Tennessee doesn't have beaches. And yet, uh, and they have similar, similar levels of poverty to a state like Arkansas. And so I thought we could do it. It's just a matter of political will. And I'll tell you now, now we have a governor, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who has wholeheartedly endorsed this idea and is working on a plan to take us in that direction. So I'm thrilled with where we're headed as a state. And I think it's a reality that, that we will see certainly within our lifetime, but hopefully much, much sooner. Well, uh, speaking of your new governor, one of her first uh, uh, reforms she pushed, which I th correct me if I'm wrong, but was successfully implemented by the legislature is a, is a somewhat of a universal school choice program. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So we passed, um, if you're familiar with ESA's education savings accounts, uh, we passed those here. Um, they're, they're called EFAs. We put uh, our own spin on it. They're educational freedom accounts. And um, they'll be phased in over a three-year period, but this is this is a huge deal. I mean, this is a game changer for parents. Um, you know, I've always believed that that parents, not the government, should be the the determiners of where and how their children are educated, and that that no child should uh, that their educational fate should be determined by either their parents' income or by the, the zip code that they happen to be born into. Right. These are all just arbitrary factors that, um, you know, in America, people can't control. So we should be. And we know that ed education is the, the great equalizer in terms of opportunity. Right. It opens all sorts of doors for people to provide for themselves, for their families, to improve their their lot in society, to change their family tree in, in a lot of ways. And so I was thrilled to see that happen. Um, you know, there was like everywhere else, uh, the status quo doesn't want to change. There was a lot of political pushback, um, but we were working hard to get this done for many years uh, in the legislature with with very little success. But um, I'll give our governor a lot of the credit for, for just having the 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 focus and the determination and and really taking the initiative to lead on this um, because we've had Republican governor for the last eight years. We've had Republican legislature uh, control of the legislature, but there wasn't the political will to get it done. Uh, and the and governor Sanders has provided that. Yeah. It, it seems to be uh, at somewhat of a tipping point in terms of that issue. Uh, a number of States have moved toward various forms of school choice programs ESAs and things like you did in Arkansas. I know Georgia tried and failed, came close, but again, with a super, with the majority of Republicans controlling the both houses, they failed to get it passed. But well, this is, I think is this it, is the direction that society is headed more broadly in terms of, of choice. You know, consumers demand choice in almost every aspect, every facet of, of modern life. And yeah, and in, in this case, the government sets arbitrary limits on where and how you can educate your children. I mean, if we if we expect choice and competition with something as simple as where we where we buy our groceries or where we eat at restaurants, how much more important is it that we have choice and competition in in an area as important 
as education. Um, think about how ridiculous it would be if the government said we had arbitrary grocery districts instead of school districts yeah. and said, oh, you can only shop. You want to go to that Whole Foods? You can't go there. You got to go to the grocery di the grocery store in your assigned zone. We would laugh at that concept. Uh, but that, right. that is sort of the way that we that we treat education. And and that model is outmoded in many ways. And so we're working to fix it. Yeah, it's ironic that we, we think education is so important, so vital that we aren't going to give you any choice. Right, right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, I'll say this, the traditional public school system always has and likely always will serve the vast majority of students. And we need to do everything that we can to make our public schools as as strong and successful and vibrant as they can be. And we did that in conjunction uh, with this school choice program. We took Arkansas from being among the bottom five states in the country for starting teacher salary into the top five in the country for starting wow. teacher salary. Wow. And when you factor in the cost of living in Arkansas, I believe if you adjust for that factor, we're, we're number one. So, um, and we invested heavily in literacy coaches, um, in, in um, high need tutoring, um, all of these sorts of things to, to give our public schools the, the tools that they need to be successful. Did the bill then have support of a lot of teachers? You know, even if maybe the, the unions didn't support it? I think there are a lot of teachers that supported um, this legislation. I can tell you in my, the, the Arkansas Teacher of the Year is a constituent of mine that lives in my district. And she came and spoke in favor of the legislation. So I heard from a lot of teachers who did like this. You know, there were some who who didn't like it, but um, I think that that was largely for a, a couple of factors. Um, one, there's some who are just politically not inclined to support reform. Um, and then two, a lot of them were being told uh, false and misleading information by outside groups that were that were agitating for political reasons against the bill. Yeah, but I, yeah. I think it's, in my opinion, you know, I don't have any, I don't think anybody's conducted any polling of teachers specifically in Arkansas on this, but from the teachers I heard from, uh, there were a good many who were very appreciative that we worked on the raise issue um, as much as we did. Um, so I, I think it had yeah. good support. Well, it seems like a lot of the impetus for these things, these reforms are COVID and, you know, parents were sitting near the computers that their kids were on during uh, virtual classes and uh, began to get more alarmed. And, and just today in the morning paper, I haven't read the details, but uh, the latest test in uh, civics, eighth grade civics and history, it's just abysmal. The uh, it's the worst performance we've ever had of eighth graders in the United States uh, I think 13% of eighth graders were able to pass a basic test on civic and um, uh, American history and civics. Uh, so we have to do something to turn that around if we hope to continue to be a free country. Absolutely. And I, I think you, you make a great point. One of the reasons, in my opinion, that we're picking up so much momentum on this issue in states across the country is because of what happened during the pandemic with uh, extended school shutdowns, uh, unions resisting opening the schools, um, even after, even, even much longer after it was safe to do so. The, the compulsory masking requirements that seemed to last forever, um, the virtual learning that was ineffective in many instances, um, the curriculum that parents saw their students learning that they had no idea they were learning, um, yeah. sometimes about radical and divisive concepts. All of these things, I think, contributed because historically, um, from a polling perspective, going back to my former, you know, my campaign operative hat for just a second, historically, from a polling perspective, people who prioritize education very highly uh, as a political issue have tend to skew strongly in favor of Democrats. But the pandemic really shifted a lot of those numbers. And you really saw the, the tangible results of that in that Virginia election um, where uh, Glenn Youngkin defeated Terry McAuliffe after he boneheadedly said that 
you know, something to the effect of teachers don't, or sorry, uh, parents don't, parents don't have any um, business uh, knowing or, or uh, dictating what goes on in the classroom. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this, uh, being in the legislature there, uh, is it a, is it a full-time legislature that you are you is a few months a year? Or how do they meet? What kind of schedule do you follow there? Yeah. So we're, we're considered a part-time legislature, um, in odd numbered years like this one, 2023, we go in the first week of January and we're usually in for about, a, a, a somewhere between 90 and 110 days. And that's our general lawmaking session. And then we come back in the even numbered years and we have a budget session. But uh, in between, there's all sorts of, of interim meetings. The committees continue to meet. Um, you obviously have constituent responsibilities in your district and um, all sorts of things. So when, when you run, they tell you it's part time. But if you're, if you're trying to do your job well and be attentive to the needs of your constituents and really uh, give all of the issues the attention that they deserve, uh, it takes up enough hours that um, it's, it really doesn't feel like it's part-time a lot of the time. Is it, is it something you'd, you know, we have young alumni who listen to this podcast. Is it something you uh, rec- would recommend to young people to consider? I mean, obviously we need good people to run for office, but uh, is, it a, is it, it's a tough uh, lifestyle, I imagine, especially if you don't live near the Capitol. You're fortunate you do. Yeah. Uh, but it's hard otherwise, I guess. That was an important consideration for me, honestly, that I that I do live not too far from our seat of government. But yes, it's something that I would recommend to people. Um, we need good people serving in, in local levels of government, in, in state government, and in the federal government. And that doesn't necessarily mean elected office. It can be uh, any number of roles, but I am, I am in particular, I feel strongly about um, serving at the state level, uh, you know, philosophically, the, uh, I believe that our founders intended for states to be the, the preeminent unit of government. And obviously, um, cities and counties are creations of the state and subject to the laws of the state. And honestly, the states are where, uh, you know, the states are, as it's commonly referenced, the laboratories of democracy. And this is where a lot of change takes place. You know, I look at and I've I've worked for many years to help elect people to important federal offices like Congress and Senate. But just the nature of our government is that you can work in um, you can work in the Congress for a decade and not do so much as change the name on a post office. But in the state government. Uh, that's where things can really happen that that have a real world impact on people's lives. You know, I've I've been in the legislature for um, going on three years now, and in, in my first session, I passed uh, seven different laws, and in my second session, I passed seventeen different laws. I was the the lead sponsor in the House on those, and so it, it is an area where you're not just spinning your wheels, right? You're not just you're not just trying to get headlines on TV or, or, you know, likes on tweets. You're, you're, you're really pursuing solutions in your state, trying to make your state the best possible place that it can be to live, to work, raise a family, start a business, grow a business, um, and, and pass it on to the next generation. So that, that's what it appeals to most about it to me. All right. Now I got to ask you the question. Have you managed to repeal any laws? <laughs> I have. Yes. So some of the, some of the laws that I pass are going back and repealing uh, yeah. o- other laws. And, you know, sometimes when I'll speak to when I'll speak to um, a group of fellow conservatives, I'll mention, you know, I passed this many laws and they're sort of a collective groan. Uh, and I and while that's true, that more laws are not uh, certainly not always good. Um, I'll remind them that some of the laws that I've passed go back and repeal old laws, but also many of the laws that I've worked to pass are laws that restrict the power of government, that um, that make government smaller and more limited uh, in ways that it is respectful of the rights of citizens. Um, you know, 
prohibiting local governments, for example, from frustrating state policy in a number of areas, and also, you know, working to protect our taxpayers. I did teach some classes as a student at University of the Ozarks, and I've always, since you brought it up, I've always thought that um, that teaching would be something that that I would enjoy. Yeah, um, working You're with students, at. especially talking about things that matter. Um, some of these great uh, philosophical debates. I'm actually yesterday I was working on a speech for uh, a local um, Lions Club that I was going to give on you know what is the role of a representative, you know, and talking about, is it to represent the wishes of your constituents or, uh, in, in more of the Edmund Burke model, are you selected, you know, to use your own wisdom and industry and judgment on behalf of the yeah. citizen? And it's, you know, these are some of the timeless debates. Uh, um, right. That, so I, I really enjoy that kind of stuff. And I, if someone, if someone were to give me the opportunity to be an adjunct somewhere, I, that's something I would definitely be interested in. Yeah, I, I think it was if it was purely to reflect your constituents, then we could just use an AI to fill in for your voting instead of uh, having David Ray there to use his judgment. Well, I've you know I've had this conversation with a lot of my constituents. One day I walked into the chamber and uh, there was a guy who was sort of hunched over his desk and he was making tally marks on a sheet of paper, and I said, "Hey, what are you what are you doing there?" And he literally said, "I'm adding up." how many people emailed me yes on this issue versus no on this issue. So I know how to vote. And I just said, look, you should take all of that under consideration, but tally marks is a really horrible way to make up your mind on of all the factors to, to uh, hinge your vote on tally marks based on the number of emails is a really bad way to come to a conclusion. I'm sure it doesn't really reflect even the, consensus of his constituents, because uh, some people tend to be more motivated to uh, uh, email than others, depending on the issue. It seems like, uh, you know, it's been observed by others that there's a propensity for government to grow because uh, the benefits of a program are very concentrated and the costs are, are very diffused. In other words, you know, as you, as you know, you pass a special program to help some group they're going to spend money on lobbying and emailing congressmen because they're getting this benefit from government. And, you know, the cost uh, is so spread out among tens of thousands or millions of taxpayers that, you know, it doesn't pay me as a taxpayer to even spend money on postage to write a letter to my representative because the cost of that program is going to be so small. And I don't even hear about it, unlike that lobby group that's going to push really hard. How do we counter that uh, trend and in the federal level, the state level, that it's easy for special interests to push their agenda and for taxpayers just to s stay quiet and then get socked with the cost. You know, the problem that you outlined is one that I see almost daily in state government. And I'll give you a couple of examples that I, that I see. You know, I was on the Revenue and Tax Committee this time around, and there's, I can't, begin to explain to you how many bills are filed each session for the very narrow purpose of exempting this or that um, X or Y from the tax code. And all of these things are done, if you factor in opportunity costs, at the expense of broad-based lower rates for all taxpayers. Um, but the special interest will fight very hard to get their specific carve out. Um, yeah. Another area that I've seen this a lot is in regards to um, occupational licensing. Uh, I, I remember a bill that I worked on with a colleague of mine in my first session, and it was to exempt uh, hair washers, people who just wanted to wash hair from the cosmetology license. And because th there was a, a girl in, in my colleague's district, a young lady who had Down syndrome and Cognitively, she was just not able to pass the cosmetology exam, uh, but she her her dream in life was to work for a salon. She was capable of and very good at washing hair and styling hair. And so we came up with this bill to create to, to just exclude hair washing and styling. If you weren't using scissors or um, or chemicals from the cosmetology license and you would have thought 
that we were, um, I mean, I, I struggle to come up with an analogy, but I mean, yeah, the, it the, might mean the, it might mean the end of civilization itself. The pushback, the pushback on this bill was more than almost any bill I've ever been involved with. And I just remember having these conversations with people saying, I don't understand what are the legitimate government safety and health concerns with washing hair because I, I washed my hair this morning and I wash my hair every morning and I don't have a license to do it. And it worked out just fine. But, <laughs> but these people who were in the industry and who were good people, right? But they were just looking out for their own turf in this particular instance, uh, didn't want this to come to pass. So we see this problem all the time that we did end up passing that bill, by the way. And it's led to an expansion of businesses in our state. We now have blow dry bars that have popped up across central Arkansas and Northwest Arkansas that, that didn't exist here before. Um, and, and Anna Lynn, that young woman that the law is named after she's gainfully employed now because of it. that's wonderful. Wonderful. And, um, but to your question about how do we fix that? The only thing that I have come up with, or there's two things. One um, you have to have people elected to office who have the philosophical underpinnings that make them aware of problems like this and give them the courage and the intellectual um, fortitude to, to resist it, right? Um, and so that just goes back to you have to elect good people and good people have to run and they have to win. But also, you know, to the extent that we can, Taxpayers have to organize as well. And, um, you know, I, I remember this was a big struggle back for several sessions in a row when I worked for Americans for Prosperity. We fought increases in the gas tax and the people pushing for the increases would say, oh, it's only going to cost you, you know, 40 cents a fill up, you know. And so it's hard for taxpayers oftentimes to get mad over 40 cents. Um, but the collective, um, the, the cumulative effect of all yeah. of these tax increases on top of one another uh, can make your state a very uncompetitive state to compete for jobs and economic growth. So groups, you know, like I used to work for Americans for Prosperity, um, groups like that that can organize taxpayers and um, urge them to take action. Um, that can sort of be a counterbalance to some of the special interest groups. And um, people who feel strongly about issues like this, I would encourage them to get to know their legislators, to cultivate a relationship with them. You know, a lot of times people assume that their elected officials are um, distant and far off and, and hard to reach. That may be the case in Congress, but for your local state legislators, you know, I represent about 30,000 people, um, but I have constituents all the time that call me on my cell phone, that text me. I put my cell phone on my website. Um, you know, it's not hard to get to know people in local elected office. And, and once you have that relationship, um, you can talk to them about issues that are important to you. Well, congratulations on the success you had on the, the hair washing. There are so many areas uh, where, licensing laws, cut off opportunity, and it is really to the least in our society who could get on that first rung of the economic ladder to success if they could get those jobs. But, you know, I've, uh, one of the founders of an organization called the Institute for Justice, Clint Bullock, is an alum of our program who I had on earlier uh, sometime last year on a podcast. Uh, you know, they fought for the right of monks in Louisiana to make caskets, wooden caskets for people to be buried in because they're the funeral directors were fighting them. You know, they fought for the rights of so many uh, in so many professions where licensing laws cut off opportunity for people. Uh, even, you know, it's, it's what we saw with uh, Uber and Lyft to some extent of uh, trying to prevent people from using their car to transport people unless they had an expensive taxi medallion. So, And I, since you gave um, Institute for Justice a shout out, I should mention that they, they helped us tremendously with our law in Arkansas that we worked on. And they've been involved in many, many laws and lawsuits in Arkansas yeah. on this front. They were involved in helping us get um, 
African style hair braiding exempted yeah. from the cosmetology license. Uh, we had a taxi cab monopoly in the city of Little Rock. And they filed a lawsuit several years ago, a public interest suit on behalf of a, uh, an independent taxi driver that was denied a license there. And they got that they got that restriction struck down. So they do great work and have done great work in Arkansas, too. Arkansas is uh, seeing freedom blossom. And uh, so on, on the income tax, what is the is the pushback uh, is probably that. Uh, we can't repeal it because we need the source of revenue to fund all these uh, programs that the state runs. Uh, are you are you proposing it be you know phased out and, and substituted by other taxes or you know I, I do th- or are you, your goal there is if you get rid of the income tax at least people then feel the taxes they pay more and that'll be a restraint on the growth of government. Yeah. So my view on this is we need to we need to gradually, but as quickly as possible, lower our rates until we get to the point where we can phase it out entirely. Um, And you do that in a number of ways, right? The the first and foremost, the biggest thing you have to you have to do is control the growth of state spending, because unlike Washington, we can't print our own money here. And so um, everything uh, if you can if you can dedicate a portion, a sizable portion of your economic growth toward reducing taxpayers burden, um, then that's going to go a long way toward lowering your rates. Um, the second thing is you've got to find ways to reduce spending in state government. I mean, the first step is stopping the slowing the growth of spending. The second thing is finding ways to eliminate spending. And that is possible, but it takes a lot of hard work. You've got to dig into issues and figure out, you know, how is the state managing its, its, uh, real estate portfolio. How is it managing its, you know, vehicle of fleet, uh, state uh, vehicle fleets? How are we managing our employee benefit programs? Uh, how many state employees do we have per capita? And how do we compare to other states? Where can we where can we um, make adjustments and consolidate and, and reform and transform government in a way that saves money through through IT through all of these different buckets, right? And you save 20 million here, you save 50 million there, 75 million there. Pretty soon you're talking about knocking several tenths of a percent off your income tax. And it really accelerates the pace that you can go. And I know other states have worked on, um, you know, in other states, it's been proposed a lot that you raise this tax and uh, in order to compensate for something else. I I don't really have much interest in doing that because I think at the end of the day, I don't, taxpayers are concerned about their overall tax burden. They're not as, yeah. they're not as upset over whether you're taken out of their left pocket or their right pocket. Um, they just, yeah. they just notice that it's gone from their pocket. Right. So right. Um, now if there are carve outs or exemptions that we can build consensus around eliminating that, that can uh, help pick up the pace, then that's something that I'm, I'd be willing to look at and consider, Um, but not really raising other rates because Arkansas, if you look at our sales tax, Arkansas already has the third highest sales tax in the entire country when you combine state and local rates. So we really don't have much room to go up in, in any other significant categories. What, what is your top income tax rate? Is it graduated or? Yeah, yes, it, it is. It is a graduated rate. Um, our top rate is now, as of today, it's 4.7. But just eight years ago, we were at 7.0. So uh-huh. we, we have made a lot of progress in this arena. And, you know, I mentioned there's so many people who, uh, especially in the early days, uh, talking about this idea, they would just poo-poo it and say, oh, this is never going to happen. And I would say, guys, what if I'm totally wrong? What if I'm completely off base? And we only get to two and a half percent instead of zero. How bad would that stink? Right? No, it wouldn't. It would be pretty doggone awesome to uh, be a state with universal school choice and a two and a half percent flat income tax. Yeah. We'd be cooking with gas if we were in that position. So from a competitiveness standpoint, we'd be attracting new movers and jobs right and left. So um, I-, I tell them, you know, this is a goal worth pursuing, no matter no matter if we succeed 100 percent or 75 percent. 
Well, David, about the time that this podcast is released, uh, we'll be welcoming about 300 college students to uh, Washington, D.C. for our summer programs uh, from colleges and universities around the country. Uh, Want to offer any advice to them that I can share with them at our orientation program? I would just say, you know, the time goes really fast. It will be over before you know it and um, make the most of every day that you have there. Make the most of the opportunities and the tours that, that you're um, that you're availed of. Um, make connections at your internships because you never know what sorts of opportunities those will turn into down the road. Um, just take full advantage of it every day, and you never know you may end up meeting your your future spouse there. Yeah, well, I regret we didn't have Jessica join you today, but. Uh... <laughs> Uh, I appreciate so much the chance to talk to you. Uh, it's exciting things you're doing in Arkansas for the people of Arkansas. Uh, we have a, a congressman, a U.S. congressman from North Carolina now, a U.S. congressman from West Tennessee, David Kustoff, who's a TFAS alum. Yes, and, he's actually my parents' congressman. Okay, Denver. yeah. And, and uh, so if you ever think about... Uh, looking to a higher office, uh, we'd have that whole belt across the center, center of our country if uh, you came to Washington. But I wish I now, wish I had I wish I had known that I met him last year at um, at a taping of uh, Mike Huckabee show in Nashville and um, got a chance to visit with him. He seems like a great guy. And yeah, um, he, he and uh, the North Carolina congressman is David Rouser, both Davids, but they, they're going to speak to our students this summer as they do most uh, summers, uh, host them up on Capitol Hill for a briefing on the floor of the House of Representatives. So I'll mention to him that we have a member of the Arkansas legislature whose parents are in his district. And uh, next time you see him, you can share your common experience with TFAS. That's great. Well, Roger, thank you so much for everything you've done and you do, you continue to do and, and TFAS. Um, this, this program, um, I believe, left an indelible mark on my life and, and uh, with memories that will last a lifetime. So just appreciate everything you do. Well, thank you. And we'll do our best again this summer to make a difference and teach kids the importance of economic freedom and its connections to human flourishing. So thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure. All the best to you, David. You too, Roger. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Liberty and Leadership Podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe, download, like, or share the show on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like this episode, I ask you to rate and review it. And if you have a comment or question for the show, please drop us an email at podcast at tfast.org. The Liberty and Leadership Podcast is produced at K Global Studios in Washington, DC. I'm your host, Roger Reen, and until next time, show courage in things large and small.